For the past two years as an engineering student here at Cal Poly, I've had many wonderful professors, but the best teacher I've ever had has been this six-year-old boy. This is my friend Levi, who fueled my interest in biomedical engineering. The first time I met Levi was on his sixth birthday. Like any other six-year-old boy, Levi loves Legos, watching TV, and surfing with his dad. Unlike other six-year-old boys, Levi was born with a congenital hand amputation that left him with around a third of his left palm. I was connected to Levi through Cal Poly. When I was accepted as a biomedical engineering student, I was excited by the school's hands-on approach. But I never expected anything like my experience with Levi. When my dad and I first visited Cal Poly, we toured the QL Plus lab. This is a space created by the Quality of Life Plus Foundation, a national organization which aims to engineer solutions for wounded veterans. Looking around at all of the posters of projects and hearing the inspiring stories of those who had been helped, I was hooked. As my dad and I were walking out of the lab, I told him I was definitely going to Cal Poly and that I would build someone a prosthetic device in my first year. A few months later, at the first QL Plus general meeting, I spoke with a club officer and I asked how I could get more involved. He met my enthusiasm with applications for project teams. Eager to join a team that would be helping a young boy in the community, I filled out all the applications for the project that they had. I went back to my dorm, I emailed a resume and a cover letter, and I waited. A week later, I had an interview, and I was teeming with excitement. On my way there, I kept checking my email to make sure I had the time and date correct when I noticed something that made my heart stop. The subject line of the email read, team lead interview. This wasn't a team member interview. <laughs> no one my age would have the audacity to apply for such a senior position. I was only two weeks into college and had no experience building a prosthetic device before. I was sure the officers were going to laugh at me. In that moment, when I was quite literally stopped in my tracks, I realized that I really only had two options. I could apologize and cancel the interview, or I could go in and give it my all because I had absolutely nothing to lose. I chose the latter, and suddenly I gained a new sense of confidence. In the worst case scenario, which was very likely, I was going to be rejected. <laughs> Regardless, I reminded myself I'd be gaining more valuable interview experience, so I went in calmly and confidently. As expected, I wasn't chosen as the team lead, but I was selected as a team member. Months later, during a moment of discouragement, I was actually told that I was the runner-up for team lead as well. While I learned a lot about the fabrication of prosthetic devices, which I'll elaborate on later, I'd now like to tell you about some of the surprising truths behind prosthetic devices. Many people don't know about how difficult it is for an amputee to get a prosthetic device that's affordable, comfortable, and useful. It shouldn't cost a limb to get a limb. The use of 3D printers and motivated students in QL Plus solves this problem. Many prosthetic devices are considered cosmetic by insurance companies, so they aren't covered under a majority of policies. As a child is growing up, they need new clothing to adapt their body's growth. And the same is true for prosthetic devices. So this would mean that for a child with a congenital amputation like Levi, his family would have to spend thousands of dollars every few years to maintain normalcy in life. Additionally, these expensive prosthetic devices are typically not well received unless they are highly functional, comfortable, and easy to use. While my project was focused on a boy, it's important to note that the other 60% of upper limb deficiencies occur in adults, so they're suffering from these policies as well. In the United States alone, approximately 1,500 children are born with an upper limb deficiency every year. Other countries show higher rates of this as well. 
According to the Center for Disease Control, the national rate of depression among adolescents is 12.5%. In children with amputations, it's around 30%. These statistics alone show the severe impact that an amputation can have on a child's well-being. It's preposterous that insurance companies consider these necessary devices to be cosmetic. Now, <laughs> building a prosthetic hand is no simple feat. But with de determination, a great team, and a hell of a lot of Starbucks, anything is possible. I remember feeling pretty nervous after the first time meeting with the team. None of us had ever built a prosthetic hand before. To mimic the human hand, the 29 major and minor bones and 17 muscles that move the hand seemed an overwhelming task. Rather than cower at this challenge, we met it through great research and computation. We held multiple meetings during the week, and meetings that lasted upwards of 12 hours, sometimes twice a weekend. These meetings never had an official end time and were typically over when someone fell asleep on their work or were too delirious to talk anymore. That person was usually me. <laughs> We read, studied, designed, debated, and tested until we were ready to start producing a prototype. Some meetings were solely based on debating a design change, and every team member had to agree before a change was made. Even as a freshman with little, in, little experience, my input was still valued as much as my peers. My team lead made sure that everyone had a say in the process, and that's why I believe we were so successful. However, that success did not come easily. Our first prototype of the hand felt like a disaster. We had used an open source hand file online, scaled it to Levi's size, printed it, and assembled it. When we were ready to give him the hand, our school media group, Mustang News, was there to cover it. While they made us look great, the hand could barely do anything other than slightly open or close, and because Levi didn't have enough strength in his residual limb, it was worthless. He saw his hand as a toy, and we saw it as a failure, so we decided to start over from scratch. Although this first hand didn't work out, it did teach us a few things. We went on to produce two more successful hand prototypes that were completely mechanical, had multi-variable grip, and could be manufactured for under $200. Now, I'm going to get a little bit technical. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to get a little bit technical for a moment, so bear with me. We designed all of our prototypes in modeling programs called NX and SolidWorks. We used the original geometry from the open source hand, changed the tension and flexion system, incorporated multivariable grip, and designed a unique socket and gauntlet system inspired by snowboard boots that we had. <laughs> Even though these hands allowed Levi to do a range of tasks like pick up objects and ride a scooter with ease, he still wasn't as inclined to use them as we wanted him to be. So we decided to create a bike attachment to spark his motivation and bridge this gap between toy and tool. Our bike attachment took around three prototypes to get right, but we've created a product that allows Levi to ride a bike like any other kid. While testing it with him, I was pretty nervous the first time he was off training wheels. Riding a bike isn't an easy task, especially without a hand. I remember standing next to his parents, almost not even wanting to watch. The biggest feeling of relief and excitement came over me when Levi jumped on his bike and started riding circles around us. He rode by us, sticking his tongue out at us, having a great time. What his dad said to us was that there was nothing special about this event. People were just passing by. After all, it was just a seven-year-old boy riding around on his bike. That was the incredible part. We had accomplished our goal of finding a motivation and normalcy for Levi to use this attachment and open up his mind to prosthetic devices. So much so that Levi is interested in becoming an engineer one day, so we often joke with his parents that soon he'll be building his own prostheses. <laughs> the best way to improve a device is through feedback. 
And what I've learned is that some of the best feedback comes from photos. So every time we meet with Levi, I take a ton of photos and I think they tell an important part of the story. Pictured here is Levi trying on his first prosthetic hand, the one which I previously described as a disaster. <laughs> as you can see, he needs help holding the tennis ball and doesn't look too excited about it. In this next hand, um, he has more independence and a slight smile, but it still wasn't the reaction we were hoping for. Here's the final hand prototype. As you can see, he's comfortably enjoying the hand. One of the greatest advancements added is probably the blue Lego pad you can see on the front of the hand for Levi to build off of. <laughs> While this reaction was amazing, we wanted to do better and we did with the bike attachment. This is pure joy. This is a child experiencing the freedom of riding around with some friends for the first time ever. This is what we spent our Friday and Saturday and sometimes Sunday nights working on. Our goal was to help Levi live a life without limitations. As much as we helped him, he gave us the invaluable opportunity to improve a life and learn a lot in the process. Currently, we're working to patent parts of our bike attachment design. We've created a file and a manual that will allow people to print a bike attachment or hand of their own with the use of a 3D printer that they can assemble with simple hardware for only the cost of the materials of under $200. Putting together one of these devices, <laughs> putting together one of these devices can be a little tricky, but it's almost like assembling an advanced Lego set with the instructions. To put it simply, engineering is problem solving. What I love so much about the field is the creativity involved and the innovation that stems from collaboration. While we can use our intelligence to bridge gaps between affordable prosthetic devices, it takes a diverse group of people to innovate. If you told me at 17 years old that I would change a boy's life, be a finalist in an international undergraduate design competition, and work to patent my ideas in less than two years, I'm not sure if I would have believed you. In the beginning, I felt like I had to fake my confidence while working with upperclassmen and graduate students. But through this project, I learned to own my strengths, ask questions, and not be afraid to contribute. When I started my engineering degree at Cal Poly, I never imagined that my best teachers would be my peers and a little six-year-old boy, or that we would end up making the impact that we did. With minimal resources and determination, we were able to create high quality, low cost devices that will help set a new standard for people to live a life without limitations. There are many new peaks to be climbed in the world of engineering. And I implore anyone inclined to pursue their dreams, whatever they are, to do it wholeheartedly. And who knows, in reaching your own pinnacles, you may enable others to do the same. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.